Hello, 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 and welcome to Miss Hope's Reading Hour on this fabulous Friday. Hello, my friends. I'm so happy to see you here today, this evening. Hopefully, you have had a thankful Thursday, found some things to be thankful for, and hopefully your Friday. Day, your Friday so far has been fabulous. So, a little news for my friends who um, go to school. Just give me a second. I want to make sure that my phone doesn't come on during the reading hour. Start ringing and things. All right. So, a little news for my friends who go to school here in Philadelphia. So starting next week, unfortunately, your Friday will be a full day, but guess what? You still get a half day on Wednesdays. On Wednesday is your half day now because some schools are about to start hybrid school, meaning that you're going to be in school some days, you're going to be home some days. So that is how your week is going to go. So for all of my friends, whatever type of school you are in right now, whether it is hybrid school, which you're in school some days and out of school some days, whether you're in school every day or whether you're home every day, hopefully Things have gotten easier for you in school and you're making friends, doing fun things, learning new stuff. I know my classes, they're doing a lot of stuff, a lot of good things. And our new program that we're using is really helping them in school. So hopefully, you know, your week has gone well and especially for my teacher friends and my parent teacher friends who are teaching and their children are home too. And also for all of you, hopefully you've had an awesome week, right? So what was I thankful for yesterday? What, what I, I had something, what was it? Of course, that I got to see another Thursday. Of course, I was thankful for that. Um, what was it? I had it right in my brain and I forgot it. Oh my goodness. Uh, I will remember it. And when I do, and probably when I'm not thinking about it, isn't that the way it happens? Probably when I'm not thinking about it, I'll be like, oh, that was my thing. Okay. So today, if you saw the teaser, we are talking about women who have persevered, meaning they've overcome obstacles. So one of our books is about a woman who overcame obstacles and about a girl. Remember, it is Women's History Month. Happy Women's History Month. I'm going to say it every day until the end of this month. Happy Women's History Month to all of you women and girls who are making a difference in the world or have made a difference in the world. Because when we have these different history months, it doesn't mean that history stops with the people who made history because there are amazing women and girls who are making history every day. And thank you guys boys, dads, uncles, grandparent, grandfathers, um, stepdads, and mentors who are helping us women make history. Because we need everyone to believe in girls and women that we can make history too and do great things. So let us get into our books. But before we do that, you know what we gotta do? Our disclaimer, the books that we read today and the wonderful music that you hear. Unfortunately, Miss Hope does not own the rights to any of it, but <laughs> it is here for your listening and reading enjoyment, okay? 
So let us get to our books for today. Our first book. Now, when I got this book, this was one of the books that I'm not sure if I got it from my school or if I got it in the boxes that were given to me of books from uh, Miss Andrea, who is a wonderful contributor to the Miss Hope's Reading Hour Library. But I was wondering, when am I going to read this book? When? Huh, it's Women's History Month. And it's talking about this very interesting girl in Dragon in the Rocks. Hmm. Now you see the girl, but Dragon in the Rocks. What could this book be talking about? You will find out when we read it. This book is by Marie Day and it is an Owl Books book, Dragon in the Rocks. Our next book is called, this is one of the new books from the latest shipment. It is called Harlem's Little Blackbird. Isn't she pretty? Harlem's Little Blackbird, the story of Florence Mills. Have you ever heard of Florence Mills? I never heard of Florence Mills. We will both learn about her today. The words to this book are by Renee Watson, Pictures by Christian Robinson, Harlem's Little Blackbird. And of course, we will be reading more about our girl Patina, Patty Ain't No Junk by Jason Reynolds. So let us get into our books. Our first book, Dragon in the Rocks by Marie Day. Let's find out about, oh, there's something on the inside. A story based on the childhood of early paleontologist, Mary Anning. Wow, I never even heard of her. So we are both about to learn about this amazing young girl and this amazing woman that we both didn't know anything about. Another instance where we're learning together. So, Dragon in the Rocks. Millions of years ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth, strange creatures swam in the sea. When they died, sand covered them where they lay on the ocean floor. Time passed, the ocean boiled and bubbled Volcanoes erupted underwater, and the floor of the sea heaved up to form great cliffs. Those ancient creatures vanished forever, and the cliffs became covered with trees and grass and wildflowers. Then people appeared. They settled in the pleasant places overlooking the sea. Two hundred years ago, in a little English seaside town called Lyme Regis, Mary Anning was born. Mary grew up in a small house with mother, with her mother and father, her brother Joseph, and her dog Trey. Early each morning, Mary helped her mother bake bread while Joseph helped his father saw wood in his workshop. The little house smelled of fresh bread and new cut wood and fragrant flowers, for Mary's mother always kept a bouquet on the table. Man, that house must have smelled wonderful. Mary's father made furniture to earn a living, but what he really liked best was collecting fossils. In those days, a lot of people spent time puzzling over these strange objects they found lying on the beach and buried in the cliff. There were odd-looking fish skeletons, giant seashells, and even plants, all as hard as stone. How did they get there? Could these fossils be clues to the unknown world of long, long ago? Mary and her father, often went down the steep path to the beach. 
She loved the smell of the salt water and the sound of the pounding waves. Sometimes, after a heavy rain, a huge chunk of clay would fall from the cliff and crack apart as they landed on the shore. When Mary and her father examined the pieces, they found mysterious bones and shells inside them. That had to be exciting. Mary learned from her father how to chip the rock hard clay with a chisel, sorry, and split it with a special little hammer. If she did it just right, a fossil would slide from the rock almost as easily as a baked cake slides from a greased pan. Mary's mother proudly placed the finest fossils on the mantelpiece where everyone could admire them. And where is my girl when I need help with sweeping floors or collecting eggs from under the hens? She often said with a smile. She's down at the shore collecting fossils. It was true. Every day, as soon as school was over, Mary wanted to rush down to the beach to search for treasure from the cliffs. It's Mary and her dad chipping away at those fossils. Mr. and Mrs. Anning sold many things on a stand in front of their house. Lace bonnets, lace and bonnets made by Mary's mother, tables and chairs made, made by Mary's father, and Joseph, strange objects that Mary and her father had collected. Come buy a fossil, Mary's father would cry. The bone of an ancient crocodile a flower now turned to stone that waved its petals at the bottom of the sea when the world was young. Come by a treasure, Mary would echo, the tooth of a cruel shark that lived long ago, a shell that sparkles like gold. All their lives, Mary and Joseph had heard about a huge fossil trapped in the cliff. The great grinning creature lay in a faraway cove where the sea crashed and foamed. Their father had been there. Many an evening would tell many an evening he would tell them about the strange creature in the rocks. Its teeth are like razors and its eyes as big as saucers, their father would begin. It's waiting there now, grinning in the dark. It looks like a dragon. Its body is as long as a rowboat and its head as large as a man. Take me there, father, Mary always begged. Please? Joseph wasn't nearly as eager. Why get so excited over some old fish bones, he would scoff. It would be hard to count the number of nights Mary asked her father to tell about his journey to find the dragon. Again and again, she heard about the treacherous climb up the slippery black cliff, how the sea soaked him through, how frightened he was, how he shivered with cold, how when how when he was ready to give up, he saw the thing right above his head and stared into its great eye at last. Mary longed for the day when she would see the giant dragon for herself. Those had to be pretty exciting stories. One cold rainy morning, Mary went down to the shore with Trey. Her father was very ill and could not leave his bed to search for fossils. Hello, Mary, a voice rang out. It was her father's good friend, Captain Fossey. Everyone called him Captain Fossey because he spent every morning, noon and evening collecting fossils on the beach. His wide plumed hat had fossil shells sewn all over it. Captain Fossey 
had seen the great dragon too. And he said when she was big enough, he'd go with Mary and her father to find it again. As always, Captain Fossey rummaged in the deep, in the deep pockets of his coat and brought out a present. Something very special today, Mary, he said. He put a lovely flat round stone in her hand. A dragon's eye, I'm sure it is. Take it along and show your father. Oh, thank you, Captain Fossey. Father is so sick. It will cheer him up, said Mary. Mary came home to find the house strangely quiet. She held the dragon's eye stone tight in her hand. Trey wagged his tail anxiously and looked up at her. They both knew something had happened. Then Mary heard the sound of someone coming downstairs. It was the doctor carrying his black bag, followed by her mother and Joseph, whose face was red from crying. The doctor put his hand on Mary's shoulder and patted it gently. You must be brave, Mary, he said, for your father has left us forever. A week after, after a week had passed, Mary's mother spoke through her tears. We are poor people. What will, we, what, will, mm, what will become of us? I will go to the town of Axminster, where there is plenty of work, said Joseph. It is not too far, and I will send money home every week. And Mary said, don't worry, mother. I will leave school and spend all day finding fossils. Trey will help me. We will sell them just as we always have. I know that is what father would want. Soon Mary was very busy. While her mother sold lace and bonnets on the stand outside the house, Mary went each day to find strange and wonderful fossils down at the shore. She took her discoveries to the busy place where the passenger coaches stopped to give horses a rest on the way to Axminster. While the horses rested, the passengers got out to stretch their legs and Mary displayed her basket of fossils for sale. The ladies and gentlemen often left her with an empty basket and her pocket full of coins. Joseph sent money, as he had promised, and he came home often. One fine summer morning, when Joseph was visiting, he and Mary decided to go down to the beach. They stopped for a few moments on the cliff and watched the puffy clouds passing by in the blue sky. Suddenly, they heard someone calling their names from the shore below. It was Captain Fossey. The weather is perfect for dragon hunting, he shouted to them. The sea is calm as glass and the wind is steady. Mary grabbed Joseph's hand and they flew down the path to the shore. Trey jumped and barked alongside them. They were going to see the great fossil at last. Teeth like razors and eyes as big as saucers. Captain Fossey led Joseph and Mary a long, long way along the rocky beach. And then they began to climb the steep, wet cliff. They clambered high over dark, slimy rocks and down past caves full of black shadows and crashing waves. Mary's heart beat fast as they edged across a narrow, slippery clay ledge that threatened to break off suddenly and fall into the sea. When they stopped to catch their breath, Mary looked back towards Lyme Regis. It was so far away the houses looked like tiny toys. When will we be there, Captain Fossey, she asked. Captain Fossey shook his head. I don't know. 
he said, gazing out to sea. And now the wind is coming up. See, the tide is rising too. We'll have to turn back. Just then, Trey started to bark from somewhere right above them. There it is. There, look up, Joseph shouted. Oh boy, they found it. Let's see what it looks like. <gasps> Wait till you see this. Half buried in the dark rock was the largest skeleton Mary had ever seen. It was more strange than the dragon in her dreams. It was as long as a rowboat. Its huge mouth was bigger than her whole body and full of razor sharp teeth. Its eye much bigger than a saucer. It was bigger than her mother's biggest plate. The one that the Christmas goose was served on. Look at that. Is that not awesome? Oh my goodness, that is amazing. We must go, Captain Fossey said. Hurry now, the tide is rising fast. Mary was so entranced that she hardly heard him. When Joseph took her hand and pulled her away, she realized with a start that ocean waves were dashing over her feet. The journey back was hard. More than once they had to scramble up the cliff as the waves grew stronger and crashed into foam just beneath them. When they arrived home, it was very late. Mary's mother scolded as she wrapped them in her warm shawl. I guess they didn't want to get caught in that cave. Once the tide was rising, they could drown. As Mary and Joseph dried themselves by the fire, they described every moment of their adventure. I'm going to dig it out of the cliff. I know I can, said Mary, when, she, when they'd finished their tale. Oh, no, you can't, said Joseph. It's huge, mother. Far too big a fossil for her to tackle. Nonsense, Joseph, their mother replied. If your sister is determined to dig that creature out of the cliff, she will. That's right, mom. Let her know she can do anything she puts her mind to. Soon, every fine day, Mary could be seen making her way down to the beach. She also wore, she always wore her father's old hat to bring her luck. Little Trey was by her side. He liked to carry her basket of tools up and down the cliff. While the tide was low, Mary chipped away at the rocks. When she carved out, when she carved out a few chunks, she would take them to a sheltered stretch of beach. There she hammered and pried the rock hard clay until the bones within were freed Back to the skeleton, she'd climb again to start all over. That is a pretty amazing feat. You saw how big that thing was? The, the weeks and months went by. The work was hard. As the hidden parts of the huge sea creature slowly emerged from the clay, Mary asked herself, herself questions about it. What was her dragon like when it was alive? What color was it? Green? Blue? Red? Striped like a sunfish? What did it eat? Down deep in the ocean? Even as it hunted, did even bigger creatures hunt for it? Was one of them trapped in the rocks, waiting now for her hammer to release it? Mary had a plan to put the creature together again. She had drawn a picture of the whole skeleton 
as best she could and had given a number to each bone. How many numbers was that? Now as she chipped each bone from the rock, she numbered it. Then she carefully wrapped each one in plaster and cloth to protect it. The baskets she carried back to her father's workshop at sunset each day were very heavy. Sometimes strong stone cutters came to help Mary. They were used to hard work. They laughed and sang as they helped her chip the bones out of the rocks. They teased Mary with a tongue-twisting chant. She sells seashells by the seashore. It made her smile, even when she was very tired and her body ached from head to toe. I guess her body did ache. That is some hard work. Hello, Miss Brandy. I'm so happy that you made it. I hope that the boys enjoy the stories. Finally, she pried the very last bone from the steep clay cliff. Mary set to work cleaning the last bits of rock from each bone with small files and brushes. When that was done, she began to put the creature's bones together again, like a huge jigsaw puzzle. She had numbered each bone so carefully that the creature took shape almost like magic on the floor of her father's workshop. Wow. Her mother brought her meals brought her meals to her there, for she would not leave until the giant fossil was complete. That is amazing. Wow. Word traveled all the way to the great city of London about a little girl who had dug a huge ancient creature out of a cliff. Many people didn't believe the story. How in the world could a child of 12 do that? One day, five important scientists came all the way from London to see Mary. They crowded into her father's workshop and marveled over the giant fossil. Oh, wait till you see it. They were amazed to see how perfectly Mary had arranged the creature's bones, just as they had been in the clay. They could hardly believe their own eyes. Please tell me, what is this creature I have found? Mary asked eagerly. The scientist explained that she had unearthed the rare skeleton of an ichthyosaurus. I got it. A giant fish lizard that had lived in the ocean millions of years ago. Like a whale, this mighty animal came to the surface for air. It had looked something like a dolphin, only much, much bigger, of course. Will you allow me to buy this remarkable fossil? Asked one of the men. I'd like to take it to a famous museum in London where thousands of people can see it. Mary nearly cried for joy. How proud her father would be how proud her how proud father would have been for her Ooh, got a little tongue tied but look at that fossil look at that skeleton isn't that amazing she put it together almost perfectly wow that night all the neighbors gathered on the beach to celebrate with mary Joseph brought a present for his sister, a chair that he had made himself covered in red satin. Mary's mother gave her a lovely lace collar to wear. There was plenty of cake and cider and lots of singing. The blacksmith played his fiddle and the schoolmaster joined in with his accordion. Trey ran around and around in excitement. Captain Fawley raised his cup high and shouted, a toast to Mary, the greatest of all the fossil seekers. Everyone clapped and cheered. As the moon set, 
and the stars became brighter, the people of Lyme Regis were still singing and dancing and talking about the great ichthy ichthyosaurus. Mary was very happy. She just knew that there were other wonderful creatures to be discovered in that cliff. The next day, she was going to set out to find them. Wow, I would be excited too. That looked like a pretty fun party. Mary Anning was a real person. With the help of her mother, she continued to search for fossils, and she spent the rest of her life digging in the cliffs at Lyme Regis for mysterious creatures from the past. When you hear the tongue twister, she sells seashells by the seashore. Think of Mary Anning, for it is said that the she who sold the shells was her. And if you go to the Natural History Museum in London, look for a creature with teeth like razors and an eye much bigger than your mother's biggest plate, the one that the holiday meal is served on. And if the creature is longer than four men put together and has flippers shaped like paddles, then you too have found Mary's dragon's dragon in the rocks. Wow, the end. What an amazing story. Mary Anning, as a teenager, as a child, finding a huge fossil, the ichthyosaurus. That is amazing. She overcame her father passing away, her own brother not believing that she could do it. And then when she set out to do the hard job, the very difficult job with the water crashing on her of getting all of those bones, people saw her determination and they were like, let me help you, Mary Anning. Now, I want to go to London just to see the Ichthyosaurus. Maybe if you look online, you can do like a virtual field trip to the Natural History Museum in London and see if you can see that Ichthyosaurus. I'm going to do that. If I find it, I'm going to put it on the Miss Hope's Reading Hour page so you guys can see it. Now, on to our next book. Harlem's Little Blackbird. The Story of Florence Mills. Words by Renee Watson. Pictures by Christian Robinson. Oh, and it looks the same underneath the bus jacket. You know, that makes Miss Hope very, very happy. You see? So, who, it, oh, look at these beautiful blackbird pictures on the inside. All right, let's see. And this is a random house book. They called her Harlem's Little Blackbird. Her name was Florence Mills. She was born in 1896 and lived in a teeny tiny itsy bitsy house in Washington, DC. A house so fragile, it would shake whenever a thunderstorm came. Mother said, don't fear, and she would sway back and forth to the rain's rhythm, singing the same spirituals that had carried her family through slavery storms. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whenever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul.
Mother's voice wrapped Florence like a warm blanket. Florence started singing too. Loud, the louder the thunder roared, the stronger she sang. Soon the storm faded to a damp drizzle. Then the drizzle disappeared. Her voice chased the storm away. Florence thought, if my voice is powerful enough to stop the rain, what else can it do? It wasn't long before Florence found out. On the playground at school, she would sing and dance. Her friends would stop playing just to listen. Whenever music would play, Florence's hands got to waving, her hips got to shaking, and her feet strutted and glided across the pavement. The catwalk is what they called it. Everyone was cakewalking, but Florence did it best. Her feet were like wings fluttering in the air. Soon Florence was cakewalking and singing in contests all over town. She won many medals. Florence had a hard time paying attention in school. Instead of listening to the teacher, she would stare out the window. The sky became her stage and she was star singing and dancing for the world. But wishing couldn't change the fact that she was just Florence Mills, the daughter of former slaves, living in a teeny tiny itsy bitsy house. Word danced around Washington about the little girl with the big talent. Florence was invited to perform at a fancy theater. The night before the show, she practiced her routine over and over. On the day of the show, when Florence and her friends arrived at the theater, nothing was what Florence had dreamed it would be. They can't come in, the manager said. He pointed to the sign that read, whites only, no Negroes in the audience. Florence used her voice to stand up for what was right. If they can't go in there, I'm staying out here, Florence said. And with her hands on her hips and her head held high, she walked away. Wait, yelled the manager. But Florence kept walking. He begged for her to perform and snuck her friends in to see the show. That night, Florence performed her best routine. Everyone stood and clapped. Good job, Florence. <laughs> Less than six years later, her family moved to New York City. Florence and her sisters became a singing and dancing trio, the Mills Sisters. They performed at Harlem's Lincoln Theater. In the summer, the Mills Sisters spent their days at Coney Island. Florence never got tired of going on rides and playing games at the arcades but nothing was as fun as performing at the Surf Avenue Opera House. Reporters followed them everywhere, and there was one sister they adored the most, 16-year-old Florence. Come hear the woman who sings like a bird. When she dances, it is as if she is, it is, as if she is flying. And she was. She flew from stage to stage, all over the country, from the East Coast to the West, until she landed at New York's 63rd Street Music Hall. It was 1921, and Florence won a role in Shuffle Along. 
the sold out show introduced jazz to white audiences. Each night, Florence gave her best. Every part of her body danced. Her eyelashes fluttered. Her fingers wiggled. She whirled around and boogied down. Night after night, she gave the audience a hand clapping, foot stomping, good time. A very special thing ha was happening in Florence. Um, sorry. A very special thing was happening in Harlem, the Harlem Renaissance. All kinds of creative minds contributed to Harlem's cultural movement. Langston Hughes penned poetry. Duke Ellington composed jazz classics. And in play after play, Florence continued to mesmerize crowds. In From Dover Street to Dixie, she was so good, the cast was invited to London. Florence was excited to travel overseas. But not everyone welcomed her. When she boarded the ship, the white passengers refused to eat in the same dining room as Florence and her troop. When she arrived in London, Many people threatened to boycott the show because they didn't want to see black performers on their stage. On opening night, Florence took a deep breath, opened her mouth, and sang one note, then another, then another. The audience was amazed. Each night, when Florence steps, stepped on stage, the audience cheered before she even opened her mouth. She was an international star. And Florence thought, if my voice can take me around the world, what else can it do? After Florence sailed back to Harlem, Mr. Zigfield, an important Broadway manager, offered Florence a leading role. She would have she would have been the first black woman to star in the Zigfield Follies. It was every performer's dream. She turned it down. Why did she turn it down, I wonder? Instead, she chose to use her voice in shows that gave unknown black singers and actors a chance to perform on stage. Florence became the leading lady in Dixie to Broadway. 100 lights shined on the marquee, flashing her name. The daughter of former slaves who grew up in a teeny tiny itsy bitsy house had made it. Florence wanted to use her voice for more than entertainment. In the show Blackbirds, she sang, I'm a little blackbird looking for a bluebird. It, be, it became her favorite song to perform, a cry for equal rights. Though I'm a darker hue, I've a heart the same as you. For love I'm dying, my heart is crying. A wise old owl said, keep on trying. I'm a little blackbird looking for a bluebird too. The show was a hit that Florence the show was such a hit that Florence was invited to London again. This time she was welcomed by photographers and news reporters. She was invited to many parties. Wow. After her performances, Florence disguised herself as so no one would recognize her. She went to hospitals to deliver flowers to patients. And she walked along the Thames River, giving money and food to beggars. Florence kept giving and dancing and singing until she was too exhausted to perform anymore. She became very ill and returned to Harlem to receive treatment from her doctor. But there was not much her doctor could do. On November 1st, 1927, Florence's song came to an end.
more than one thousand more than one hundred fifty thousand mourners flooded the streets of Harlem to say goodbye. Letters, telegrams, and flowers were sent to her family from all over the world. People who had a lot and people who had a little, politicians and entertainers, whites and blacks, gave tribute to Florence Mills. Even blackbirds came. Hundreds of them were seen hovering nearby. Florence's dream lives on in the singers and dancers who came after her. It lives on in the heart of every boy and girl in a teeny tiny itsy bitsy place who dreams of doing great, big, gigantic, enormous things. The end. Wow, what an amazing story about Florence Mills, who also persevered through Jim Crow laws and people not wanting her to be on their stages. That must have been hard to sing somewhere where they don't want to eat with you. But she persevered and she used her voice, not just to sing, but to fight for what was right. And also, she helped those who were less fortunate. She gave love and kindness to people who were sick and people who were poor. That was an amazing story. Amazing story. Oh, we learned so much about these two people. I love it when I get to learn with you guys at the same time. That always makes me so happy we get to learn things together. Now, we got a little bit more time so we can find out more about our girl Patina. Cause you know, Patty ain't no junk, right? We gotta read some more about her and her family. We're learning a lot about Patina and we're just in the first chapter, y'all. All right. So this is after they've gone to church. Because remember, Patina's mom, she had to have her legs amputated up to a certain spot because of her diabetes. And they live, her and her sister live with her aunt and uncle. But every Sunday, they go to church with their mom. So we're still in church. But there's one part of the service where Ma always eases up on acting like a warden. And that's when Pastor Carter starts sweating and Sister Jefferson starts laughing. See, when the sweat and laughter come, that's that basically means the spirit is in the building. And when Pastor starts banging his hand on the pulpit and throws out one of those everybody knows it scriptures like, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's the cue for the organ player, Dante, to to get ready to play the happy music. Happy music sounds like the music that they play at the beginning of baseball games, except sped up and looped over and over and over again until every lady in the church catches the spirit. And when you catch the spirit, that don't mean you reach out and grab it like a ball or something. It's not like that. Catching the spirit is more like the spirit catching you. And when it happens, you dance, but not like dance dance, not like cotton be dancing. You dance like the church is roach infested and it's your job to step on them all. Like you trying to put a hole in the floor, like you trying to break the heel off your white church pumps. And Ma loves this. She always has, but now she can't dance. So when she looks down the aisle during this part, it's because she wants to see me and Maddie catch the spirit. Actually, she just wants to see us do a triple time step. See us move our legs a million miles a minute. Maddie loves it. 
As soon as she hears the music, she gets to bouncing around in her seat the same way she does when I'm doing her hair. Me? Well, I don't ever really feel nothing, but I love my mother. So I give Maddie the look and she stands up, shoulders rocking, silly smile smeared across her lips, but only for a second before she mimics the other saints and screws her face up like she just caught another whiff, whiff of the Thomases. Then I stand up. Ma rolls the wheelchair back so we have enough space to slide out of the pew without tripping or brushing against the wheels of her chair and dirtying up our holy dresses. And once we're out, oh, it is party time. More like workout time. It's like Black River Dance or something like that. Actually, it reminds me of some of the warm-up drills coach makes us do at practice. High knees, footwork, and Ma loves it. But she can't fist, but she can't fist bump and yell. Go, Maddie. Go, Patty. Go, go, go in church. Not really appropriate. But what she can do is yell, yes, Lord, yes, thank you, Lord, thank you. And that's basically the same thing. After service, Momly is always waiting for us. And I go through the same process, getting Ma in the car, the wheelchair in the trunk. The only difference is on the ride home. Ma's all high off Jesus and now ready to talk about what I'm normally doing great at even though not so great this week, running. You know, I pray for you. I pray God put something special in your legs and in your muscles so you can run and not grow, and not grow weary, she said, lifting a finger in the air, proud that she was able to slip a Bible verse into regular conversation, a thing she was always trying to do. She's really something, Bev, Momly adds. I hate when they try to make me feel better by talking around me like I'm not right there. I lost. I lost. I lost. I lost. I sit in the back, clenching my jaw. Maddie sit next, sits next to me, kicking the back of Momly's seat. Oh, I know she is because she's mine. Ma turns around. And this time beams at me. And I don't make no junk. <laughs> to do. Introduce myself. Which I should have done a while ago. I should probably introduce myself. My name is Patina Jones. And I ain't no junk. I also ain't no hair flipper. And most of the girls at Chester Academy are hair flippers. Who be looking at me like my mom's some kind of junk maker. But I ain't gonna, I ain't none of, but ain't none of them got the guts to come out of their mouths with no craziness. They just turn and flip their dingy ponytails toward me like I care. <laughs> I guess it's no secret that it's never easy being the new girl. And I bet that the new girl, but I'm sorry, and I get to be the new girl in two different places on the Defenders team and at Chester. Lucky me. But at least the, de the Defenders I can deal with because I know for a fact I can run. I've been running track for three years now, thanks to my Uncle Tony. Well, not just him. It really has more to do with my mom, dad, Uncle Tony, and Maddie. My whole family. But let's just say Uncle Tony okie doked the idea into my brain. See, it was my dad's birthday and also a few months before my mother's legs were taken and we were celebrating the cupcakes, real cupcakes, not pretend ones, that my mother had baked in honor of him. Yellow cake, strawberry icing, dad's recipe. It had become tradition that I loved even though it always made me sad. 
it was really just a chance for everybody to sit around and for the old heads to crack jokes and tell me and Maddie stories about him. Maddie never knew him. And even though I did, and I remember him, I'll never ever forget him. There were a lot, a lot of things I just didn't know. Like how he used to make beats and sell instrumental tapes to aspiring rappers and singers in the neighborhood. And how he used the money he made from that to put himself through culinary school to become a pastry chef. And how he loved letting me lick the batter off the spoon before baking a cake, but not nearly as much as he loved seeing me chomp down on the finished product. But apparently, according to Uncle Tony, None of these things were as sweet to him as seeing me run. Your daddy called me when you took your first step, Uncle Tony, peeling the paper from his cupcake explained in the middle of an I remember when session. I answered the phone and Ronnie just started yelling, she did it, Toon, my baby did it. Toon was what my dad called Uncle Tony, a nickname from when they were kids back when Uncle Tony was obsessed with, you guessed it, cartoons. He sure did. He was so proud his pancake was walking. Ma confirmed, smirking like this memory didn't bother her, even though the shine in her eyes said different. Maddie, who was too young to really care about any of this, listened in, cupcake icing smeared all over her chin. Didn't really make sense for me to wipe her mouth until she was done making a mess. The things you learn. But when you started running, Uncle Tony shook his head. That's when he really lost it. He sent me videos every other day of you dashing back and forth across the room. Little fat legs just moving. But you'd have thought you'd grown wings and started flying or something the way Ronnie was acting. Uncle Tony licked pink frosting off the cupcake and went on. I don't know what it was about seeing you move like that, but your daddy loved it. You were definitely his pancake, but you were also his little sprinter. All right, my friends, we will end there. So Miss Patina Jones has introduced herself to us. Finally, on chapter two. So we learned that she kind of had talent. Oh, no, we're in chapter three. I'm sorry. So apparently, Miss Patina had some track skills and talent even before she knew it, even when she was a baby. And her dad was very, very proud of his little sprinter, his little pancake. So, possibly what happened is they okey-doked her, as, as she said, into joining the track team. So, we'll see how that okey-doke kind of happened on our marvelous Monday broadcast. Well, my friends, today we read two awesome books about young women who made Amazing things happened, did amazing things. Mary Anning, who almost by herself brought down all the bones from in that cave of the Ichthyosaurus that is probably still in the Natural History Museum of London today. And the um, little Harlem's little blackbird, Florence Mills, who also started as a very young person using her beautiful voice to perform and to fight for what was right. And of course, we're learning more about Miss Patina Jones, who her mother says ain't no junk because she don't make no junk. Well, my friends, I'm so glad I was able to be here with you today and we learned some new things together. And I can't wait for what we will learn on Monday in our books that we have on our Marvelous Monday on that broadcast. 
Well, with all that being said, my friends, thank you so much for being here on this fabulous Friday. Have a great weekend, and I will see you on Marvelous Monday, right here on this Hope's Reading Hour. Until then, my friends. <laughs>